Hello everyone and thank you so much for coming out this evening to go on this musical journey with us. Jake Heggie's at the Statue of Venus holds a very special place in my heart. I first met Rose, the main character of this piece, about three years ago during my time at Johns Hopkins and I've known for several years now that our time together was not yet over. She had more of a story to tell and I'm so grateful to be sharing that story with all of you here tonight. This evening, I'll be discussing the relevance of the theme and the role of the piano in the scene for piano and soprano. The theme represents Rose's waiting. Each time we hear the theme appear, whether within the accompaniment or the vocal line, Rose is waiting, thus allowing her mind to wander, and there's often a shift in thought. The accompaniment as a whole plays a much larger role, practically guiding Rose emotionally through the scene. The word scene almost feels like an understatement for this 20-some minute adventure. Over the near half hour, we come to know Rose and the accompaniment very well. We learn of her struggles, her hopes, her sense of humor, and most importantly, I think we can all find a bit of ourselves within her. Composer Jake Heggie has been hailed by the Wall Street Journal as arguably the world's most popular 21st century opera and art song composer, and his works have been referred to as consistently illuminating and full of surprises by Gramophone Magazine. To echo the writers at Gramophone, I can assure you, At the Statue of Venus does not disappoint in its illumination and final surprise. Librettist Terence McNally was a several time Tony Award winning librettist. He was most known for his five Tony Awards, including Kiss of the Spider Woman and Ragtime. McNally and Heggie collaborated on several works throughout their careers together. Successful collaborations between the pair include Great Scott, Dead Man Walking, and today's feature presentation, At the Statue of Venus. This piece was written in 2005, and it was also the pair's penultimate work together before McNally's passing in 2020. As aforementioned, Rose is our main character within this scene. Rose presents nearly all of our dialogue within the scene. While Rose is our most prominent character, there are a total of three characters present, Rose, the accompaniment, and the blind date. The way in which these characters work together helps shape the narrative of the scene. I note the accompaniment as a character of its own because of its importance within the scene. There are frequent moments throughout the scene where the dialogue is very much communicated by the accompaniment. Rose is described by Heggie as an attractive modern woman who is proudly successful and probably divorced. And through much of Rose's monologue, we hear her pride and confidence manifest and contradict her feelings of self-doubt and anxiousness. Heggie's full description of the piece is as follows. An attractive woman waits in a museum by the statue of the goddess of love to meet a man she has never seen. Her thoughts and emotions are a jumble of hope, uncertainty, and self-doubt. Will he like her? Will she like him? Why did she, a proudly successful modern woman, probably divorced, allow her friends to convince her they had found a Mr. Right for her? We all know that Mr. Right doesn't exist. Or does he? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. To be willing to be judged by another person. Does anything make us more human? More vulnerable, but human too. Heggy and McNally also note, a woman enters. Her name is Rose. She wears well-cut black slacks, low heels, a crisp white blouse with reasonable cleavage, a modest necklace and earrings to complete her look, which is best described as open, honest, and direct. She stands for a moment, looking around, getting her bearings, and then looks at her watch and begins to wait. Waiting is something we will see Rose grapple with for quite some time throughout this piece. 
And now you'll hear me note the timelessness of this piece, which I will absolutely stand by. However, you will also note the black slacks are the only costuming note I've taken, as these play a pivotal role in the storytelling. I could not, however, bring myself to take the 2005 fashion advice otherwise noted. <laughs> Stick around, we got tons of jokes. While the story is through composed, this scene can be broken down into five sections. Section one, the slacks were a mistake, where we meet Rose for the first time. Here she's nervously dissecting her phone conversation with her blind date, and she assesses her situation and her outfit. Section two, look at all these women, where Rose begins to compare herself to the um, artwork around her. She's in awe of these masterpieces surrounding her and wonders what it's like to be loved the way these women were loved. Section three, it's him. In this section, Rose anxiously waits and is approached by strangers she feels may be him. She then fears he may have left, judged her already, and changed his mind. Section four, lucky child, where Rose recalls her happy childhood and the love she felt growing up. That is the love she's looking for. She wants to feel safe and protected. She's hopeful. And section five, will I know him? In this final section, Rose defines what love is to her and a sense of confidence is finally instilled within her. Each section consists of unique musical ideas, which help us determine their separation from one another. However, more importantly, each section features a main idea. While Rose has a multitude of thoughts running through her mind over the course of the scene, these five are the core. These are ideas which need, uh, or problems which need to be solved or emotions which need to be understood. They are introduced with a short bit of dialogue and the vocal line delineating the switch to a new main idea. The accompaniment guides Rose on her journey, at times signaling to her when it's time to move on, both in terms of her thoughts and emotions. At the downbeat of this piece, Rose is nervously waiting. Over the course of the scene, her emotions move rapidly from one to another until her final resolve in section five. The most prominent emotions which Rose experiences throughout the scene are those with the relationship between anxiousness versus excitement and confidence versus certainty. We will also see Rose experience passion, anger, sadness, calmness, and finally, resolve. Each shift is coaxed by the accompaniment, either through its own agency, by matching and then shifting Rose's emotions, or by means of the theme. The theme is an often present aspect of both the accompaniment and the vocal line, and it's a sign of Rose anxiously waiting for her blind date. The theme, shown above, frequently switches from 5-8 to 3-4 time signature, creating a spinning motion indicative of turning gears, much like you'd see depicted over a cartoon character's head in a moment of deep thought, these moments represent Rose's waiting and wandering mind. And Heggie has used this spinning theme to paint the idea of Rose's mind while she waits. The 5-8 odd meter means the theme contains simple and compound beats. The simple one, two, followed by the compound one, two, three, is indicative of a heartbeat. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. This heartbeat speeds up and slows down, much like our own heartbeats do when we are experiencing heightened emotion. And when we are alone, waiting with our own thoughts, what can we do other than become increasingly aware of that beating in our chest? We're going to play the introduction for you in a moment and you'll be listening for the following theme shown above and how it adapts through the introduction. Here's the theme. And here's the full introduction.
Throughout that introduction, you heard the theme presented in a few different ways. As Rose waits, her thoughts are constantly turning, shifting, and growing. At first, we hear the theme in its typical brisk tempo, but as the introduction progresses, we hear a descending line increasingly speed up into Rose's first line, the slacks were a mistake. The theme will continue to appear through the arch of the scene. You'll notice the theme most obviously appear when Rose is silently waiting. However, it's also regularly present in the supporting accompaniment as well as the vocal line. While the accompaniment is the main purveyor of our theme, Rose's first line, the slacks were a mistake, imitates the theme before handing it back to the piano. This happens several times, mostly on the text, da, 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 as Rose waits and struggles to settle her emotions regarding her blind date. But what's the point of Rose also singing the theme when we hear it so often from the piano? Rose's choice to sing the theme allows us to see the moments in which she's trying to fill the space. Rose is talking to herself for the entirety of the scene. She's distracting herself from how nervous she is. Waiting here at the Statue of Venus is one of the more stressful things she's decided to do. And what better way to distract oneself when the silence of waiting is so much than to hum? The first time we very obviously hear Rose take over the theme is in section one. This sets up this reoccurring idea and creates a sense of familiarity when we return to it. She will continue to do this throughout the first three sections of the scene. Here's the first instance of Rose's theme, an excerpt from section one. Here, we see the theme both in the piano and the vocal line. noted, the theme is only noticeably present throughout the first three sections of the piece. The last two sections are void of the theme almost entirely, as Rose's waiting is no longer the focal point of the piece. In these sections, her mind shifts away from her immediate situation. In section four, Lucky Child, Rose is recalling her happy childhood. The lack of a theme presents the sense that this section exists out of time from the rest of the scene. Rose is in her own world and no longer waiting. She's forgotten about the date altogether for a moment and she instead recollects the happiest time in her life. After this section, she's so happy that waiting is no longer something which makes her nervous, but instead excited. The last time we noticeably hear the theme is before the final chord. We hear this theme, this time truncated and with closure signaling to us two things. First, this short burst of energy represents Rose's heart fluttering once more, this time with excitement. And two, Rose is no longer waiting. She's finally met her blind date. The theme of At the Statue of Venus manifests as a sign of Rose's waiting. Each time we hear that theme, Rose is waiting for the next thought. At times, this theme helps us to distract from our current situation, which for Rose is less than ideal, such as in section one, when she's anxiously about, anxious about her choice of outfit. However, sometimes she does just the opposite by allowing her thoughts to wander to the worst case scenario. When Rose does allow her anxiety to get the better of her, it's the accompaniment which pulls her back to reality. While working with her, the accompaniment also has agency of its own. The accompaniment and the accompanist have a huge role in the scene. While many shifts throughout the piece begin with Rose, she isn't always in control. Throughout the piece, we hear the piano lead Rose to where she needs to be emotionally. 
So let's look at some examples of this relationship between Rose and the accompaniment. A notable moment is Heggie's use of slow arpeggiated chords in the accompaniment to signal the presence of the blind date. This moment happens twice, once at the end of the piece and once before she recalls her phone call with him. Rose is nervous, but with the sound of these arpeggios, marked slow and languorous, she begins to settle. In this moment, the pianist reminds Rose why she's here in the first place. Sure, she's wearing black slacks, and might not, right now, that might feel like the end of the world. But what brought her to this moment was the sexy voice she heard on the phone. This voice, represented by these arpeggios in the accompaniment, sparked Rose's interest enough to be at the Statue of Venus to begin with. Here are those arpeggiated chords. While the piano leads Rose into this section, she takes the reins and begins to spiral at the thought that her date could in fact be gay. The accompaniment begins to follow Rose's spirals with hints of the theme before pulling her out of it with a sustained calm chord, and she resolves that if he is in fact gay, it won't matter she wore the slacks. The theme then propels us into Rose's next moment of waiting. Throughout this piece, Rose allows her nerves to get the better of her in multiple situations. The piano follows, matches that anxiety, but each time it's the piano and the accompanist bringing her back to reality and grounding her in her emotions. The most prominent moment of the piano grounding Rose is the lead in to the penultimate section of the scene. The peak of this interlude is shown above. Right before this, Rose has once again allowed her nervous energy to get the better of her and has gotten into a fight with her blind date in her head. She's so riled up that we hear this dense and heightened interlude in the accompaniment matching her energy. The accompaniment rises in pitch, mimicking Rose reaching her boiling point before it gradually slows, descends in pitch level, and settles Rose with it. She resolves that she can't leave yet, or she'll never know. The piano then leads her into the calmest section of the scene, Lucky Child, where she recalls her childhood and the happiness she felt growing up. section, Lucky Child is completely led by the piano. Repeated eighth notes create a sense of forward motion, and in between Rose's verses, the bass line propels her into her next happy thought. The close of this section and recollection of the love Rose is in search for sets up the final section. The piano simply leads Rose to ask herself, will I know him? To which she answers, of course I will. The accompaniment in the finale of the scene grows in intensity as Rose's confidence is at its peak. Shortly before the conclusion of this piece, we once again hear the arpeggiated slow and languorous chords in the accompaniment as shown above. These chords are signaling the approaching and perhaps presence of the blind date. Here's the accompaniment heard during the finale, followed by the repeat of the slow and languorous chords we heard in the first section of the piece.
After this, Rose announces, I'll meet you at the Statue of Venus. This is the second time she said this line. The first time, she was imitating the blind date. This time, it's her, confidently giving in to the possibility which awaits her. This final musical line is the most poignant in the scene. While it has some of the most sparse accompaniment supporting it, it follows the most harmonically dense moment of the scene. Rose has just made this huge declaration. We will brave this world together for the rest of our days. And based upon its heavy harmonic support, the accompaniment agrees with her. And then, silence. You see what I did there? You're edge of your seats, right? <laughs> the power of silence strengthens the intensity of what we just heard. It draws our attention to what's about to be the most important moment we've all been waiting for, the introduction of the blind date. At the Statue of Venus features a theme which signals to us a moment of uncertainty in the form of waiting. Each time the accompaniment presents the theme, Rose is waiting and allowing her mind to wander. When Rose herself sings the theme, she's trying to allow her mind to wander to anything else to lessen the burden of waiting. The accompaniment is a character of its own. While Rose is in control of her own fate, it does not go unnoticed that the accompaniment is leading her to a place of calm. When she begins to worry or feel anxious or ask herself questions which couldn't possibly be answered yet, it's the piano that pulls her back to reality and settles her down for a comfortable path. Without this character, it could be argued that Rose would have left. She would have allowed her nervous energy to get the better of her, and we would have no end to our story. Heggie and McNally write in their program notes, we identify with Rose. We hope you will too. And I must echo throughout my time discovering Rose and her journey, I find it hard not to identify with her. The expert setting combined with such relevant, relatable text create a story I think we can all find part of ourselves in. And I know what you're thinking, does Rose ever meet the blind date? After 20 some minutes of falling in love with her and her story, surely Heggy and McNally would not leave us hanging. Rest assured, I would not dream of not giving you that answer, and in many ways, I already have. Perhaps Rose's blind date has been here all along, listening to her, guiding her. Perhaps she knows them and is unaware. At the Statue of Venus does not disappoint in its illumination and final surprise. You will have your answer in approximately 30 minutes. I hope you enjoy hearing this full, heartfelt, silly, timeless musical story. Thank you.
Oh, 